Um, our next speaker in the session is uh, Professor Charles Hillman, who is an associate professor in the Department of Kinesiology and Community Health. Um, his particular work focuses on uh, kinesiology and its intersection with dementia, old age, uh, basically the ability to preserve our quality of life and preserve our mental faculties as we go into old age. And as considering the, you know, as life expectancy rises in the United States and in the world, um, this becomes increasingly important. Um, his work has been featured in many places, the New York Times, um, was where I discovered him, uh, Newsweek. Um, you know, it's basically sort of a crossed over into the fascination with, you know, how do we preserve and extend uh, the quality of our lives? And so he's going to touch upon some of those themes. Professor Hillman. Okay, uh, good afternoon. So um, uh, I'll start by, by thanking the, uh, the organizers of TED here, um, but also uh, uh, to split a little bit of my uh, disgruntledness with them because uh, I would get these emails uh, after agreeing to speak, and, uh, and these emails would say things to me like, uh, don't give a lecture. And, well, as a scientist, I give lectures. And it would, uh, they would say things like, uh, command the stage. Well, I usually let my data command the stage, and I sort of hide off to the side over here and hope that my data speaks for itself. Um, and then they said to tell a story. And uh, telling a story is okay. I, I think I could do that. But they'd prefer that it, it weaved sort of pieces of me into it. And uh, I can't claim to ever have gotten up in front of an audience and talked about myself, uh, at least not intentionally. And so it... Um, it got a, you know, there's a little bit of anxiety there. But uh, once that subsided, I realized that this could actually be quite fun. And so um, I've spent some time uh, thinking about what it's going to, uh, what's sort of driven me over the last 15 years to study the relationship between um, exercise, brain, and cognition uh, for the purposes of bettering health and uh, function across the lifespan. And so in, uh, in telling this story, um, I'm going to travel backwards down the number line. I'm going to talk about older adults first and, and how we can sort of stave off uh, cognitive aging uh, in the sort of late stages of our life, and how we can live healthier um, during the early stages of our life and really have a more effective uh, functioning throughout the lifespan. And so I'll start my story by talking about uh, um, myself at the age of 24. I had uh, matriculated out of the University of Florida with a master's degree uh, where my thesis was studying the psychophysiology of sports fans, a really hot topic that it is, right? Um, I got to the University of Maryland uh, under the... Um, under the guidance of a guy named Brad Hatfield. And uh, Brad's, uh, his laboratory was uh, focused on the relationship between physical activity and cognitive aging. I thought that that's sort of cool, but uh, it occurred to me, I really didn't know anything about aging, not a thing. Um, in fact, um, both of my grandparents passed away, uh, gran my grandfathers, I should say, passed away uh, very young, far too young. Uh, my dad's dad, he, um, he died before I was born. He died around the age of 50 of a heart attack. Um, and he likely died because uh, his, his family said he was too thin. And uh, in order to be healthy, they needed to fatten him up a bit. And so they fed him uh, glasses of cream, drizzled chicken fat on his eggs. And today we, we know that probably led to atherosclerosis, and he, he died of a heart attack at certainly too young of an age. Um, a bit ironic, actually. Uh, my, my mom's dad, uh, he died at the age of 60. I didn't know him, but, uh, but I was very young when he died. And... Um, and what I knew of him, uh, or my memories of him, is that he was actually quite the athlete. And uh, I'd always heard stories about over in Europe how he played tennis and he swam and he, uh, he skied and he played soccer. And um, he did all these really active things. But by the time I knew him, uh, you know, he was, you know, well, unfortunately, in the later stages of his life, but by the time I knew him, he, uh, he had escaped Hitler. He uh, had had a stint in the military. He was a tireless worker, uh, had an, an amazing work ethic. And, um, you know, he, he carried a lot of stress, and, and certainly he died at, at too young of an age as well. And so what happened is, is that by the time I got to the University of Maryland, and I was 24 years old, um, I really didn't have a good view of aging. In fact, this was my view of aging. It was very neat, it was clean, it was lines on a page, and it's really the academic's view of aging. Um, it wasn't... Uh, you know, it was basically a picture of all these things that can go wrong, but they weren't real. It wasn't the real world. And so I didn't have a good understanding of what it meant to age, and I didn't have a good understanding of what it meant to age well. And so um, what I did know is I knew, that, uh, I knew that aging was bad for the body, 
There was uh, new evidence suggesting that it was bad for the brain. Maybe not all that new, but imaging methods were improved. And so all these images came out of older brains and telling us how older brains uh, are very different than younger brains. And you, know, you can certainly see that here. Um, but I also thought that this idea that exercise c- could promote better brain health and cognition was really fascinating. But I was even more intrigued by the idea that I could marry my... Uh, my hobbies, my athletic hobbies, with my area of science. And I figure if I can go through life doing that, well, then I, I have a, I'm going to have a pretty happy work life, right? I, can, I could basically spend time working at my hobbies. And so um, what changed my world at this point was one afternoon, uh, typically I think it was a Wednesday. Uh, it's, it's been 13 years, so maybe a little uh, cognitive memory loss or age-related memory loss has kicked in. But uh, uh, typically on Wednesday afternoons, I would... Uh, I would go play a lunchtime game of hockey. And um, this is not unusual for me um, because anyone who knows me uh, will tell you that I'd rather talk about hockey than talk about science. Um, My wife will tell you that that's the only thing that I'll talk about, but I'll correct her and tell her that uh, I would also talk about the band Fish as much uh, as I talk about hockey. Um, And so, uh, you know, this one day, uh, and actually this, this is more recent, uh, so, um, but there aren't any pictures of me playing hockey in my 20s. Um, and so this one day, I'm out at the rink. Uh, I'm getting dressed. I'm in the locker room with the guys that I'm always there with. We're all 20-somethings. We're all uh, joking around, having a good time. And these two older guys walk in. And they, uh, they're dressed, and they drop a whole bunch of pennies onto the, onto the um, floor of the locker room. In sort of a rather attacking style, they say, put these on, we'll see you on the ice. And they leave. Well... You can imagine the jokes we told at their expense while we were putting on our gear, you know, thinking these guys don't stand a shot at playing us. And so we get on the ice, and there's a whole group of these guys. They're all in their 60s and 70s. They're, uh, they're all dressed in uniforms. They're all there to, to play hockey. And when the puck drops, and uh, as luck would have it, uh, the puck squirts out to me. Um, I, you know, I skate across the blue line. Uh, this is my story, so I'm going to tell it how, how, I, how I remember it. And I, I take a blazing slap shot. It goes right over the goalie's left shoulder, and sure enough, I score. Anyone who's seen me play hockey uh, will tell you that it was probably more of a fluttering duck than it was a, a blazing slap shot. But regardless, it's my story. And, uh, and so what happened next is I, um, what happened next is I'm skating away, having a joke at, this, at the goalie's expense with uh, one of the guys I was playing with, and out of the blue, some guy comes up and just nails me, which is... If you know anything about hockey, you know that, that that's a fight starter right there. Um, but after nailing me, he stands over me and looks down and says, I'm 65 years old, I've had both my hips replaced, and I have a better slap shot than you do. And he did. He, this team went on to beat us, I don't know, 20 to 1, 25 to 1. That was the only goal we scored. And uh, it, was, it, it was eye-opening. It was real world, and these were real older adults playing against a bunch of 20-something kids. And... Um, I later found out it was the senior Olympic team in the state of Maryland, but uh, that's besides the point. So um, what happened then is I crawled back to the lab. I licked my wounds. um, And after thinking about it, I actually got quite excited about my work because I realized for the first time that physical activity can make a difference in studying older, uh, sorry, can make a difference in the lives of older adults and their cognitive health and function. And so uh, I thought a lot about the data that were available um, and I became a big fan of the work of Art Kramer and Eddie McCauley, who are both here on this campus. And uh, this, the data that they had, and these are a little bit later, but the data that they had showed the areas of the brain that were most affected by age. And they also showed the areas of the brain that are most, uh, that are most benefited by fitness. And as you can see, they, they're, uh, they're overlapping. And so um, it was serendipity that a few years later, uh, I arrived at uh, the University of Illinois as a young assistant professor straight out of the University of Maryland, and I, got, I built a lab, and I got right to work, uh, working on my model of uh, physical activity and cognition in older adults. And um, things are going pretty good. A couple, day, uh, a couple years later, uh, Art again shaped the field by suggesting that, uh, that while physical activity is beneficial to cognition in a general fashion, it's also selectively and disproportionately beneficial to tasks or task components that require greater amounts of executive control, as you can see here, these types of uh, cognition. And so um, with this knowledge, and certainly uh, 
Art's very strong argument, um, I started to look through my own data. And I found that, indeed, our data are very similar in the sense that for older adults, and since, since that time we know it's true across the lifespan, but for older adults, aspects of cognition that involve um, prefrontal lobe and uh, cert- um, are selectively benefited by, ex- um, by physical activity. While there are benefits overall, it is really these aspects of physical acti- of cognition that are most benefited. And so things are going well. I had a few, I had a few ideas, a few turned into grants, uh, had a few other ideas, it became papers, and so I thought I was you know, doing uh, pretty good work. And then back in 2003, uh, again, I got thrown for a loop. Um, I wasn't physically checked to the ice, but uh, I was definitely metaphorically checked to the ice. Uh, in 2003, my wife Lisa gave birth to our son, AJ. This picture is taken a few years later. Um, and so uh, I was a bit scared. If you found AJ, you'll see why I'm a bit scared. Um, and I was also a bit, I was a bit confused. Uh, the world didn't revolve around me anymore. I revolved around someone else. And um, I spent time thinking a lot about children. And it was about a year, maybe two years later, on one of those cold champagne days where I was uh, at the mall because there's nothing else to do. We have them playing in that sort of disgusting kid pit where you have all these kids running around and they're, you know, crawling in and out of everything. They're jumping around like lunatics, uh, you know, climb on everything they can. But then there's this other group of kids, and they're sort of off in the periphery, sitting very quietly and just sort of entertaining themselves without much movement. And I got to thinking that there's a lot of variability in behavior, even at a young age. And I was wondering if there's any benefits to being physically active at a very young age as opposed to being physically active later in life. And so... With that sort of question, I went back to my lab. I started to comb through the developmental literature, mind you, knowing nothing about it. And I learned some really scary stuff. What I learned was that kids are becoming more sedentary than ever before. I learned that three out of every four high school kids don't engage in the recommended amount of physical activity each week. And I learned that there's an increased prevalence of being overweight and unfit, which is certainly something that's been in the news quite a bit. But I also learned that sedentary childhood leads to sedentary adulthood, meaning that the physical activity behaviors that we learn, we tend to learn in childhood. And we might display them later in life, but they're at least learned early in our lives. But most alarmingly, what I learned was that recent estimates, two different estimates, had uh, suggested that younger generations will live less healthy and have shorter lives than their parents, marking the first time in US history. And I learned that schools were exacerbating this issue by eliminating the amount of physical activity Uh, that occurs during the school day in favor of uh, formal academic topics because teachers are being forced to teach to tests and budget cuts and all those sorts of things. And so I came to the conclusion that it's great to find ways to improve cognitive health during older adulthood. And I don't mean to minimize that at all. But for me, I felt it's important to, uh, and maybe even more meaningful, to try and improve cognitive health and function during childhood, by getting kids to be more active, and maybe they'll never grow into that sedentary older adult. And thus, I would have lessened cognitive aging in some small way. And so I set out to understand what this relationship was between physical activity, exercise, and brain health during development. And what I found was that time spent engaged in physical activity doesn't detract from from academic performance. And in fact, it might even help it, as these data show, where Fitness tests, uh, in which kids perform better on these tests, relates to better performance than academic achievement tests. And so I was energized by these data. I walked into my lab one day, and I told my graduate students that we're no longer studying aging. That we're going to turn our paradigm upside down, and we're going to study kids. We had no idea how we were going to go about that, and there's a lot of hits and misses in there. Um, but that we were going to, this is the focus of the lab, and it's been that focus ever since. And so since that time, we found a whole slew of different interesting findings. We found that... Uh, We found that high-fit kids have different patterns of activation that support cognition relative to lower-fit kids. Uh, Along with the guidance of of a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Neil Cohen, we learned that the hippocampus uh, is also influenced by fitness, and the hippocampus supports different aspects of memory. Um, We've learned that's not all good, as exercise, uh, as cognitive control or, or executive control is decayed during exercise. 
But that falling exercise, whoops, uh, falling exercise uh, for about a moment, I'm going to blow in the punchline, uh, for about one moment, uh, sorry, for about one hour after exercise, uh, we learned that uh, it's better for cognition. And so a single bout of exercise can improve cognitive function for about one hour afterwards, approximately. And this has a relationship to uh, cognitive testing uh, uh, in academic topics as well. And so with these data in hand, I'm now left wondering, why is it that exercise seems to promote better cognitive health and function? There are a number of findings at the molecular, cellular, systems, and, and behavioral levels that all support this behavior, this relationship. But I would argue that while these are all interesting and descriptive explanations, that there's a much more basic explanation out there. And so when you look at uh, researchers like Frank Booth or Fernando Gomez Pania, they suggest that in a society that recognizes uh, the benefits of physical activity, it's ironic that, that physical inactivity characterizes the vast majorities of our behaviors. And so they argue that in part this is largely due to the benefits reaped by technology, which have obviated the need for physical labor. And our early ancestors, which were hunters and gatherers, uh, were much more active than we are today. And so physical activity might be a program necessity of our genes, and today we remain descendants of that genome that our ancestors acquired through an active uh, lifestyle. But unfortunately, the amount of physical activity that we uh, endure today is significantly below that which we were genetically programmed to do. And so the consequences of being sedentary uh, have, demonst have been demonstrated through the ill health of both children and adults. And so where that leaves me today is sort of uh, at the very beginnings of uh, where I think we'll be in the next 20 or 30 years. Um, I got to say, at my age, I don't think a whole lot about life and death. I, I just don't. Uh, I'm too busy with my family. I'm too busy with my work to really think about matters such as this that, that will occur at some point inevitably, but not right now. And so uh, I would argue that I'm surrounded by life, both at home and in my lab. And uh, my graduate students and my son keep me feeling you know, young, challenged, and energized. And so I'm very sort of, uh, very, um, sort of happy in my outlook at life at this point. Um, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that my graduate students are also experiencing life themselves. And that uh, living life at this point uh, is certainly something that it's taken me a while to learn, but it's more than just uh, being in my laboratory working all the time, and that there's a whole life out there beyond that of what goes on on paper. Um, but like many of us, I do see hope in the future, and that's where I think, uh, where I, I feel that my work should have its biggest impact. Um, I think, I hope that my work serves to promote better health and function and improve the quality of life of all individuals as they progress through the lifespan. Um, I hope that uh, I, I've demonstrated that through an active lifestyle uh, and a, at a young age, we can promote better health and function um, in older adults as they progress towards death um, while living life to the fullest. So thank you. <laughs>